In this video, we're going to cover vowels and their production as well as transcription, just like we did with consonants. We'll go over all the different types of vowels, their symbols, and then we'll do some practice. But the first type of vowels we'll talk about are simple vowels, and these are vowels that you can essentially hold without moving your tongue, lips, or anything for a period of time. So something like e, u, u, a, things like that. So these are all the symbols for our 10 or so simple vowels. So for instance, in beat, you have the E sound. This is represented with the lowercase i. I as in bit, we have the small caps i. Again, these are very important. You're writing the symbols exactly as they're presented when you have the sound. So beat E gets this symbol. I bit gets this symbol. Okay, bet E. You have the e as in bet, epsilon, bet, same sound. Bat, a, bat, bot, a, bot. Depending on your dialect, you may have this vowel, a, for bot. Uh, this is something called the caught, caught merger, where some people say caught and caught as the same vowel, like I do, while other people will say caught with the top vowel and caught with the bottom vowel. So depending on your dialect, you may have a ah and o, ah, or you may have just a. Ah. In boot, you have the u. In book, you have u. Uh. Notice u and u, uh, they're spelled with the same letters in boot and book, but they make different sounds. In but, you have this a uh sound. And this symbol here, this upside down backwards e, is called a schwa. And this is the sound made in about, in these unstressed syllables. So English has a stress system. In stressed syllables, you will never get a schwa. But in unstressed syllables, like in about, about, you'll have a schwa. Hear how quick that is, about. Compare that to but. That uh in but is much longer than the uh in about. So these two sounds can sound very similar. In fact, they have almost the same place of articulation, but the schwa will appear in unstressed positions. It is a reduced vowel, about. We'll cover this more in a few slides. Finally, we have this rhoticized schwa, this R-colored schwa, like in bird, er, er. I'm introducing it here, quite frankly, because there's not really a good place to introduce it. So. This is the er sound in stress syllables. So bird in stress syllables with the er, you have a schwar. So this is called a schwar. In other words, it's an R colored schwa. The second type of sound we have are diphthongs. And these require movement of your tongue. So I, I, I as in light. I, light. I have, I have some raising there. Canadian raising in I and light. Light light, light. So you can feel the movement, I. It starts down at the bottom where the a ah is and it moves towards this e, eh, I. In loud, we have that ow sound. And one thing to note is that these are just one segment. So we could put a little tie bar around them just like we did with affricates, but it's not necessary. Normally we know in a transcription that when we have these two vowels side by side, it's a diphthong. We have oi as an oil. We have late, so a, late. And then we have o as in low. So English has five diphthongs, i, ow, oi, o, and a. Depending on the person who's teaching you transcriptions, you may also see a schwa and an u uh for something like in the word pure, that sound at the end. Actually, I believe it might be an uh and then a schwa. This, yeah, an uh and then a schwa. This isn't a notation that I see too often, but it is something that you might see in your transcriptions. Instead of a schwa, you might use the uh, the, the diphthong in pure here. Okay, so let's talk more about the schwa. What I said before was that schwa appears in unstressed syllables. So kind of uh, just some words that show it. One would be about, 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 that first sound. Another word like Canada, Canada, Canada. 
these two A's in Canada make that schwa sound. Canada. There's no stress. Canada. Some people might say Canada, in which case you wouldn't have a schwa in the last one. Attention. Attention. Uh, you have the schwa at the beginning and attention. Some people would also transcribe a schwa in the last. Attention. Attention. Chun, chun. You can kind of hear this very slightly reduced schwa. So you might see either a schwa N at the end, or some people do what's called a syllabic N. Uh, either way, depending on who you're learning phonetics from, you'll see these two variations. Finally, in some cases, the word the, the, will just have a schwa at the end. So sometimes it's stressed, like, I know the place to be or I know the place to be, and you get that sound like an E or a uh, as in but, but most of the time, most of the time, most of the time, it's a schwa, it's unstressed, most of the time, uh. Again, the schwa is very difficult to hear for some people, so if you can't hear it, I would suggest going online, looking up interactive IPA charts, and listening to the vowel, because it is very difficult to hear with just three minutes of training. Okay, so those are all the vowels, and I want to introduce the symbols and the sounds before we talk about descriptions, because the descriptions can be quite intimidating. So before, with the consonants, we talked about voicing, manner, and place. But with a description of a vowel, we need four different components. We need height, we need frontness, roundedness, and tenseness. And this all happens to be about your tongue, and then roundedness would be about your lips. So the first description is height, and that is how high in your mouth is your tongue. So we can kind of break these up into sections here. So we have the high, the mid, and the low. Of course, these vowels are also other languages in the world. We'll focus on the English one shortly, but just to separate them. We have high, mid, and low, and height. So you can see a sound like E... E is very high. Compare that with a sound like ah or a, ah, e, a, ah, e, a. Ah. You can feel a difference between e and a ah in the height of your tongue. Frontness. A sound can either be front, central, or back. So again, we can kind of make some lines here. So now we can talk about the height, so high, mid, or low, and whether it's front, so front, central, or back. So compare something like e and oo, e, oo, they have the same height, but e is very forward and oo is very back. The next one is roundedness. So some sounds are rounded, like oo in the top right and o right below it. But other sounds like e or e or a, these are unrounded. Finally, the last one is tenseness. And tenseness is a little bit hard to explain. I have another slide on it coming up, but if you compare a sound like e and i, usually in elementary school and middle school, we would call these long vowels and short vowels. That's not really the best way to think about it. Really the difference between e and i is they're both relatively the same place, e and i. They're very close to each other. The difference between e and i is that e has a lot more tense in it, while i has no tenseness in your tongue. So e is tense and i is what we call lax. And we can also see the difference between e and i. I is more central to the mouth because it is lax. Compa same, same thing with u and u, as in boot and book. U is just a lax version of u. Again, we'll talk more about this. So we can describe every single vowel with these four different properties. So just looking at the vowel chart, let's do some practice. So for instance, the first one I want to describe E. So I take a look, I'm going to circle it, I'm going to put a box around it here. So the first thing we talk about is height. So this is a high vowel. Then we talk about how forward the tongue is. So it's high and it's front. So we can tell it's high because it's in the top third, it's front because it's in the forward third. Uh, then we talk about roundedness, e, e, when you make the sound e, it is unrounded. And it is also a tense vowel, 
So we could call this E, the high front unrounded tense vowel. We can see we need a lot of descriptions here to do this. Now I just want to point out that beside it, we have the rounded version. So on the left, it's unrounded. On the right, it's rounded when you have the dot there. So just like we have the voiceless voice distinction in the consonants, we have the unrounded roundedness distinction presented in the same way. So compare the two high front vowels, E and U, E and U. So the only difference between those two is rounding. Okay, let's do A. And A is in kind of a weird spot here, but we'll consider this low. So it's in between low and mid, but we'll still consider it low. It is lower than it is mid. So we could call this a low front. So this is still front. It's still in the same depth as E. So E and A, the only difference is the height. Uh, it is unrounded. And it is a lax vowel. So A, A does not have the same tenseness that E or U has. OK, finally, let's do U. So I'll circle this one as well. So this is now going to be a high vowel. It is a back vowel. It is rounded, so it's on the right side. Ooh, you can even feel it in your lips, ooh. And it is a tense vowel. OK, so you might be thinking, OK, what does an unrounded ooh sound like? So this one right here, ooh, ooh, ooh. It doesn't sound that different. In fact, this is the same oo that you would hear in Japanese, for instance, the unrounded oo. So a lot of speakers who want to learn a language like Japanese, when they first learn the language in class, they'll say like poo or foo or ku, and they'll round their lips, when really it's more like a ku or foo. Very hard to hear. So it's unlikely that you would ever actually make this adjustment on your own without learning a little bit about linguistics and phonetics. OK, now let's talk about the difference between tense and lax. So with tense vowels, it's usually a little bit tighter and a little bit longer. So for instance, some tense vowels would be like e, ah, u, o, oi, i, a. So all of your diphthongs are going to be tense because they all start with tense vowels. So the first segment, e, is tense, the first segment, o, is tense, and the first segment, a, is tense. Similarly, sounds like e, u, and a are also tense in English. Now, the lax vowels are much less common. So you have like e, so it's the lax version of e, essentially. You have u, uh, the lax version of u, you have a, which is lax. You have your epsilon e, which is lax. So compare e and e. Then you have your schwa, which is lax because it's in unstressed positions. And then you have your uh, like in but, which is also lax. OK, so now that you have all those descriptions down, well, you won't have all those descriptions down. You should definitely do some practice on your own and work with them, because if you can pick them up in 14 minutes, you are just brilliant. Let's do some transcription practice. So we want to transcribe the whole word in these cases. So I'll pronounce it. You can pause it, and then you can try to transcribe it. And then I'll write down the answer. So the first one, elbow, elbow, elbow. OK, so I hear an eh. I hear an o, I hear a b, and I hear that o, elbow. So this has four segments. If I want, I can put a little diacritic above o to signal that it's a diphthong, but I am aware that it's a diphthong, elbow. OK, the next one, a door, a door, a door. OK, so this one is a little bit trickier. So we have a, that's our schwa at the beginning, a door. Then we have our D. And now this is a case where you would probably think a door, a door. So you put the diphthong in there. And then, of course, we have our R at the end. But this is correct as far as from what I've taught you. However, when we have this O diphthong before the ER in English, typically it's shorter and it's just a simple O. So a door, a door. Compare a door with a door. A door, a door. There's this slight difference. The first one, a door, 
has no diphthong, but a door would have a diphthong. So it would depend on the pronunciation here. Okay, clinical, 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 clinical. Okay, k, u, i, n, i, k, a schwa, and then ol. Clinical, clinical, clinical. Now you may have variations here. You may have someone who says something like clinical, 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 clinical. So you can hear the difference between the i and the schwa in clinical, clinical. It just depends on the pronunciation. Finally, the last one, inquire, inquire, inquire. So the first one is an i. And then we have this ng, ku, w, i, er. Okay, so there may be two things that you're looking at thinking, whoa, what's going on? The first one is the first sound, inquire, inquire. Some people hear this first sound as an e. Now I'm going to pronounce it with an e. Inquire, inquire. Notice how much stronger and higher that is, inquire. The reason this is i for inquire is because this nasal n kind of colorizes and nasalizes that first i, inquire. So we hear it as a little bit higher and stronger, like an e. But this is really an i, inquire. And secondly, you may be wondering, well, what's this sound? What's this w? So I'll introduce these here. These are our two glide sounds. W is a labio-velar glide. So this is the W sound. It uses your lips for rounding and your velum to make the W or W. And then finally, one sound we don't have is the Y. So in a word like yes, we could transcribe it like Y, S. And this is the voiced palatal glide. Yeah. Okay, so that's it for phonetics. We'll see you next time with phonology. So if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below and I'll answer them the best that I can.